My guest is a stand-up comedian and podcaster based out of L.A. He's a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. He's also a Muslim who can't stop eating bacon. I'm excited to welcome Mike Eshack. Hello, everybody. What's cracking? What's Thanks popping? for coming on, buddy. Thank you, buddy. It's good to see you again, man. See those beautiful blue eyes. Yeah, buddy. Are you in Toronto right now? I am in Toronto. I'm doing the backroom comedy club out here. For okay. Shows. I didn't know if you were doing House of Comedy or one of those yuck yucks or... No. Is it your first time working in Canada? No, I did. A, I did a House of Comedy in um, Vancouver, West. opening for Tricks. Oh yeah, <laughs> and then I, I also, I also did uh, what, what, whatever the House of Comedy of Vancouver was before Laugh Lines. I've done that like a few years ago. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so still haven't done building. Canada at all. I fuck, it. dude. I just worked with this guy from L.A. He's now in L.A. But he's originally from uh, Calgary. Brett Forte is his name, and Canadian comics, dude, they they're they're fucking good. Somebody I mean, told me uh, last night at the show, one of the one of the guys that walked up to me after the show was like, "Dude, you're fucking awesome." He's like, "Do you know Brett Forte?" And I was like, "No, I think I can need to know him. Apparently, he's really funny." Yeah, I worked with him at the La Jolla Comedy Store, and did you? He's yeah, did he he's, bring you out, or did you just end up having to have have that? job i went uh there was like sort of a how do i say this <laughs> on air that's i i was booked for something and he was also booked for the essentially the same thing ended up working together um but it was it was a blast man He's yeah that's a strong good. comic and funny fucking guy really good nice. dude too he's just like hustling and out in la but it was a lot of fun, man. Um, before we jump into just like my the interview piece, uh, sure. if you are watching us on YouTube, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe, hit the notifications bell. Uh, we also are on Patreon, patreon.com slash FNFpod, so make sure to support us. Uh, Mike is on YouTube as well, so check out his YouTube channel. But you and I met, uh, we have this sort of a weird connection because we know some similar people from when you started, but we met during Seattle International Comedy Competition. What do you think of the competition? It was funny because Angelica is here. She lives in Toronto, so she came last night and did a guest set. We uh, uh, competed with her. Um, I thought the I thought I thought it was great. I think the thing that I took from it the most was I've never been in a competition where you're at it for literally one month. It's a one month long competition, and if you start from the top and you make it all the way to the end, I think the biggest thing that I learned. Because you get to see the same comics perform over and over and over again, you get to see how each performance handles a crowd that doesn't vibe with them, and then how their energy changes when the when the crowd does vibe with them, and yeah. then it, and then it made me learn. Oh, so it's not only me. It's not only me that turns into the Hulk when the crowd is vibing, and then it's you know my performance and my body language and everything that I deliver is way better, way different, I'm looser, uh, I'm, I'm willing to add more tags, try newer stuff. Uh, it, it is very interesting because I thought it was just me, but then when I saw everyone else have those mediocre sets, right, and then see their body language and how they're saying their jokes, and then when they are having a set where the crowd loves them, and then watching how their performance and everything about their set changes. So I think that's the thing I learned the most. Oh, for sure. Shout out to Taylor Clark, too. He's he's running the competition right yeah, now. Yeah, Taylor. Fox, the OG who's been running it. But no, what I, do you I think about it? Think, um, yeah, a lot of similarity. I, I think just the duration of it, like ki being consistent across shows like that, it's really hard to do. And yeah. Exactly. What, I think the hardest thing was like when you go up during a show, when there's – 12 14 people on a show i mean it really changes what that set's going to look like and there were certain nights where it's like once an audience has seen 12 people they're kind of tired and they're like they're do you really think that thing that that that's what it is or is it is it that they're tired or is it that a comic comes in before you uh breaks the room with the joke in a way that that raises the laugh bar that's how I look at it. I don't look at them as that they're tired. I, th I look at them as that they have been acclimated 
to a, a, a specific type of laughter. And it could have been the comic before you just was vibing with them better and then he hit that note and then you come in after with a different energy and you're just not hitting that note. Sure. I, th I think it's both. I do. Like, I think there are situations when, like, when you have 14 people, uh, I did a show earlier this week where it was like there were 14 people on the show. Like and a was, showcase show. Yeah, and it was, you know, two and a half hours long, and there's a certain point in time with with audiences where, like, dude, if you sit in those chairs for two and a, two, two and a half hours, you're going to get kind of worn down a little bit. So, and you've, you've just seen, like, it's like being three quarters of way into a movie rather than the start of the movie. And just because you've already came, mean it's better. you've already came. It's like, it's like they, yeah. they, they busted too many nuts and the refractory period is now a lot longer. Sure. But there's there, that's not an excuse for anything, right? Like if, if you know what you're doing, if you know how to do you, you should be able to go up there and do whatever that's it is. That's the way I look at situation. it. Yeah. Cause I've seen but, headliners crush no matter what. And then you sure, see them Roger again. Roger Lazola had one of those sets. Like Roger, I think he went last at, at Auburn and he just absolutely annihilated. And it was one of those shows. It was a marathon show. So it's like, yeah. it's not an excuse, but it's, it's, uh, just going into what you were talking about, like the, the, how your jokes delivery and stuff get affected. Yeah. You feel it. Like, but as don't a you think it's also in your head? Cause there's a part of me, brother, I swear to God, I'm trying to get in the mindset of the audience is not tired. You're just in your head about going last after all these killers just broke the fucking the th the fourth wall of of laughter or whatever you want to talk about. You know what I mean? Like they burst that bubble so many times, and then it's like, can you? Is the audience tired, or do you need to come in there with the energy of you're the first comic or you're the middle comic or whatever it is that makes you feel comfortable? Because there's a part of me, man. I swear to God, I refuse to believe they're tired. I just, I look at it like they're not tired, that, that other comics have hit this level of laughter and, th and they're seeing the laughter come in closer succession because each comic is doing a showcase set. So they're basically compressing their laughs. I mean, I don't know, that's what I do. If I'm doing like a 10 minute set, I'll give them 15 minutes of material squeezed into 10 minutes. Meaning mm -hmm. now it's airtight, you know what I mean? So I don't know. I just have a hard time believing they're tired. I just think that they've been acclimated. And then because they've been acclimated, I'm in my head about it. And then I go up there and then and then and then I'll hit hit a joke. And then if that first joke doesn't land like I want to, then I'm in my head even more. So I dig myself into a psychological hole, is the way I look at it. Yeah, it's definitely unless you do stand up like it doesn't make sense what the fuck we're talking about at all. No, it, I know it, we're boring it's, everyone. It's, it, and I, I think a lot of people that watch and listen are really into stand up. But yeah, there's so much. It people always talk about how they are, and that you, they never talk about like how are you. You know, like when you're going on stage, ma mindset, headspace, and shit like that. And I think you know having good headspace is critical. Like you have to you have to control what you can control. But at the end of the day, to me, it's a two-way conversation. And sometimes that conversation channel isn't open. Like, I, I did have the mindset for a while of just, like, always being like, you know what, this is me. What do I do? And then I did a show with one of the best comedians I know. And it was, like, five people in a terrible bar. And I was like, oh, there is such a thing as an unworkable environment. Like, this is somebody that has killed in every room possible and... There is, there's this distribution of thing, types of shows that there can be. And I'm not saying that's what it was for Sick, but there, there are shows that exist that, like, everybody's going to do terrible on. Oh, yeah. Like, it's just But then the you, don't, you, don't, you don't think it's also getting in your head about it? You also don't think that? Because I, I, I I, I'm trying to exercise this mindset of just, fuck these people. I'm going to get them. I'm going to get them. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, it's like no problem. I'm going to have fun with them. That's, I think that's another thing yeah. is that if I connect that's, with them and have fun with them. That's the Chase DeRusso right there. Chase DeRusso is all about Chase. like, yeah, like he just, he wants to have the most fun. And I, that's the mindset that I think I'm okay with adopting is like, hey, you can't control how they are, but you can control how much fun you have in the situation. Amen. So Amen, brother. That's, that's what I. 
that's it's great. hard that's, though. It's it, hard, you know. It is, but it is. especially when you have that fear of like, I need to do well. But that's that's another problem. See, so I get in my head when thing when the stakes are high. So let's say I'm at the comedy store and the booker's there, and I only got three minutes. Yeah. You know, and then you go up there and the, the three three comics that go up ahead of you don't do too well. And then now you're like, oh, fuck this crowd. And then, then you get up there and then you're fucking rigid and then you fucking bomb. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know? And they're not thinking about that for more than a quarter of a second while you go and think about it all night long. Yeah. Yeah. It's Bro, this, 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 this business is a psychological mind fuck, but I like it because it takes you through the ringer of how you have to deal with your brain. Because, like, for example, I was in, I was in Austin. Uh, I had three shows one night. First show, East Austin Comedy Club, murdered. And I don't say that lightly, Adam, you know what I mean? And then yeah. the second show, murdered even more. I fucking crushed. I don't tell. I closed it out, crushed. Sold so much merch. People joined my mailing list. They thought I was a god. Then the last show was at the Vulcan. And if anybody doesn't know, the Vulcan in Austin is actually a music venue. It's not made for stand-up. And I went in doing that show like I did the other shows where each room was groomed for stand-up. And I ate a bag of dicks, bro. Oh, I dude. ate so many fucking dicks on that last show that the other two shows that I just did that day didn't count. I went home yeah. feeling like shit. Dude, that's how I like to go home. That's where I've gotten to recently. It's like, I want to go do a good show and then take me over to the worst room possible and have me going to sleep, questioning everything about my life. Because yeah, then dude. then you wake up the next day and you're like, I need to be motivated. But I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. Where you're like, dude, I'm fine. Like, I, I got this or whatever. And then you go into this environment like it's like seeing a, a different pitcher after you've been to see somebody throw fastballs all weekend. Amen. And then you're you're like you know what i, I what does it matter i i got this and then yeah. you see a curveball and you're like what the and uh -huh. he just embarrasses you and you're like yes. wow i yeah there's this it's a very being present i think is the best thing you can be like whatever this like staying level where you're not too high not too low all that shit but i mean this you started, started last did you week start recording my Detroit? special uh, uh no well Disclaimer, I started doing comedy, uh, doing improv at the Second City in Detroit back when it started, first started coming up in the early 2000s. And I was very lucky to be doing it back then because I, I, I went to Second City, Detroit in a moment where every fucking killer in the world was being born. Tim Robinson, Sam Richardson, Keegan Michael Key, Mary Beth Monroe. These, all these people are on TV doing fucking big things. And these are people that I performed with and learned with and and then now uh, a long story short i created a web series which mocks a reality show and i did it so well that it looked like a real reality show and then that got me work on real reality shows so that's what got me to hollywood so i started producing reality shows for roughly five years and then i went to indonesia had an intense mushroom trip met god it's a woman and then she told me to go back to comedy she told me to how to reinvest my real estate and fast forward six years now i'm in comedy i'm headlining i just shot my special last week and i own 16 homes so <laughs> that was my journey to to comedy was it went from well let's uh, that, that was 30 seconds let's break this down a little bit like you you and I connected because we knew a uh, mutual comic guy that's taking me on the road a little bit, Dave Landau. And I was curious what you guys started at second city together. He what was, was in Dave my Landau? first class. Yeah. What was he like at that point in time? Uh, he was funny, man. Uh, I think he found out after taking that first class that he wasn't going to do improv. He was mainly a stand up comedian. Right. Uh, and I can't remember how long he's been doing stand up. But Dave Landau, man, for as long as I've known him, he's had 45-year-old energy. He's always been the guy that he is now. He's never changed, dude. Like, he's funnier. Of course, he's matured and stuff like that. But even back then, when we would talk, he would talk to you like he was somebody's father. You know how Dave Landau really? is. He's got that voice. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, and he was very funny at improv. I remember when we were doing improv, he was just, he didn't play characters. 
So I was always like the actors. So I was playing different characters. You know, every time I was this person, that person, different potty postures, pretending I had glasses, being a nerd, a scientist. He always played Dave Landau, and he always played like the straight guy that was so matter of fact, and 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 he would just say little short matter of fact things in scenes, and it would be so fucking funny. And yeah. that's how we connected, man. That's how I I've known Dave. But then it wasn't it, after that class. He he wasn't doing improv no more, and I was just staying with improv and. Uh, I graduated and I was also an understudy so yeah but Dave Landau is uh he's an OG man oh for sure so were you you were in the Marines did you do that after Second City no I was in the Marines first so when did you okay when did you enlist and then like how what was the timing of that you mean like what year how old were you? Like, when did you get into Second City, and, like, how long were you in the Marines before that? So I was in the Marines for four years, from 95 to 99. I got out in 99. Uh, around 99, 2000, I went to a community college and took some acting classes because I really wanted to get into uh, entertainment. At the time, I was working as an engineering technician at Detroit Diesel before I got laid off. So uh, a friend of mine named Adam Peacock, who was in the... Uh, community college with me who's a real good friend of mine he's also in the new season of uh i think you should leave dear friend we were in community college together we were uh the practical jokers of the entire class and then he came to me one day and he was like hey dude i'm taking classes at second city uh you want to take a class with me and i was just like oh, i don't even know what that is he's like it's improv theater and he kind of gave me like a history of it and i'm like fuck it let's take a class so we took a class and oddly enough my first month there, they had auditions for understudy, and I fucking got it. And you won't believe how I got it. They had they 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 put us up there and they made us play these improv games. And the one that got it for me was this. Mind you, this is like three months after 9/11 or so. Uh, they had a a, a, a a improv game where it's called Three Through the Door. So they put one person in the middle. The person in the middle in the stage just reacts. And you have to come out of a door, create a character, say a one line in the voice of that character, walk back in the door, close it, create another character, open the door. So you're doing that three times. So each time you open the door, you're playing a different character, different accent, whatever. You say one line, and then you come out. I did one, I did two, and then on the third one, bro, this was ballsy as fuck. On the third one, bro, this is like literally three months after 9-11, I came out as a suicide bomber. Okay. <laughs> Bro, but this got me the audition. So I came out as a suicide bomber and I came out the door and I screamed with realism. I didn't try to play it funny. And I just went trying to blow up my, I tried to pull the ripcord on my chest. And I came out and when I opened the door, I went, Allah Akbar! And I went to go pull it and then I pretended like it didn't work. And then when it didn't work, I said, fuck! And I walked out the door, and it leveled the fucking room. Everybody fucking lost their shit. And then one of the, uh, one of the, uh, one of the improvisers, Jeff Fritz, who was one of the judges, who's also an improviser, he's like, dude, that's how you got it. Because we were like, if he's ballsy enough to take a risk like that and know how to make it funny, we got to make, make him an understudy. So my, my, my um, movement through Second City was oddly really fucking quick. Um, yes. so that's how I started it. But then in the end, I wasn't that good at improv. In the very, very final, throughout the whole road, I wasn't that good at improv, but I was making sketch videos with people like Tim and, and so forth. And then I, I got really good at filmmaking, and I got really good at injecting comedy into my filmmaking uh, that I ended up start doing that more. And then that led to the web series, and then the web series led that to me to do real reality shows in Hollywood. But when you were in the Marines, did you know this is what you wanted to do? Like that, it just is such a no. different chains of pace to go from like a serious. I mean, being being Muslim and a Marine, like that's that's a whole different chapter of your life that just seems to be. I don't think I've met anybody in comedy that has that background. Uh, yeah, it's 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 rare, man. I mean, the the real reason why I joined the the Marines was because my dad was a ball buster, man. My dad was so fucking strict. 
He was so fucking structured and rigid and uh, he never let me really enjoy hanging out with my friends and I kind of resented him about it. And even my mom told my dad, she was like, you need to let up off of me. Otherwise, one of these days he's going to try to like leave or something. And my dad would not listen to my mom and my mom's begging. Just, But he's a man. Let him fucking. I mean, by the time I graduated uh, high school, my curfew was nine o'clock. Take that into consideration. That's how strict this guy was. He robbed me of my childhood because he was so fucking strict. Uh, and then, uh, you know, one day me and him got into a fucking fist fight. I punched my dad in the face for the first time. And I remember once I hit him in the face, I was like, what the fuck am I doing? And then I crouched down on the floor because I felt like really bad. And he threw all my clothes at me. He kicked me out of the fucking house. My mom was crying. My, my sister was crying. The fucking cats ran in the basement. My dad fucking like just lost it, kicked me out of the house. And he was like, if you can't follow my rules, why don't you join the Marines? Follow their rules. Next day I signed up. Damn. So the Dude, next that's day, that's a I signed weird up. feeling when you realize that you're stronger than your dad too. I know. Like, <laughs> it's it's a weird feeling in in the development of a man. Like I remember, I had a moment with my dad where I like it got kind of heated like that, and just like looking him in the face, and both of us kind of we it didn't come to blows like that. But I I did have that happen with my older brother once, and I he 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 used to dude he used to fuck with me like bad constantly how much older one day uh two and a half years to the day and it was like once i was like 15 or 16 he tried to do it one time and i lit him up and it it the whole dynamic changed yeah like yeah your balls dropped (laughs) yeah my younger brother did it to me too one time too like he did jujitsu and like uh, martial arts and stuff one time i tried to fuck him and he kicked me in the chest dude like off of a boat into water and like, <laughs> what the fuck just happened to me like, I, was, and then i don't think i really ever fucked with him since like uh, once somebody gets you good you're like yeah i don't have that power anymore like when you hit the water you're like now i know how my dad felt <laughs> <laughs> and I went, oh, my brother felt in the chest too. Like it was like out of a movie or something. Oh, You're never that's great to be kicked in the chest. Was there people on the boat that witnessed it? Yeah, everybody <laughs> saw. He embarrassed me, dude. How much younger is he? He's ba- uh, three years. Three years, so, yeah. So yeah, that you were like, just, oh shit! I was like a senior <laughs> in high school, bro. <laughs> uh, you, if I was your age, I was going to the Marines. You know, like yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was a that's great, bro. It was crazy. But so what was the Marines that's, like? Oh, here I forgot to tell you, man. Like when I this is the funny part. Like, I remember so my my buddy who's a real good friend of mine, he's Egyptian and he is also uh very religious. He's very melodramatic. Ever since we were a kid, he's so melodramatic about fucking religion. This to me is really funny because we were working the same job and then later on I was like, take me to that payphone. This is back when we had payphones. So I called the recruiter. And on the phone, I asked the recruiter, I'm like, hey, man, my dad kicked me out of the house. I need someplace to go. I want to join the Marines, right? So when I got back in the car, my good friend D, he was like, I'm not taking you there. And I'm like, no, you're taking me there. He goes, no, I'm not. I go, why? He goes, you're not joining the Marines, bro. And I was like, all right, dude. So I got up and I started walking. And then he pulls up next to me. He's all right, just get in the car. But just get in the car. And we start driving. Then he starts getting melodramatic, like religious. And he looks at me and he goes, you know what, bro? I think, I think God wants me to drive you there for a reason. I was like, yeah, why? He goes, I think this is supposed to happen, bro. This is supposed to happen. I'm supposed to drive you to the recruiting station because I'm going to talk you out of it. And then we get there, <laughs> and then we get there, and that motherfucker signs up with me. No way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, where's God now, motherfucker? I'm like, what yeah. the fuck? I thought you were supposed to. But he, I signed the dotted line, and then he ended up signing with me. We and joined he's on... still a Marine today. <laughs> no, no, no. He got out the same time I did. But then we joined on the buddy system, and we went together. And it was really funny, because then my mom and my dad were mad at me. And then I also had his mom and dad mad at me, because they're all blaming me for making him go. And then that ultimately got my mom to divorce my dad. So once, my mom, once I joined the Marines, my mom said to my dad, you killed our son. I want a divorce. Because well, that whole- had to have been crazy for them just... I mean, where were you deployed? And like, I mean, you're Muslim. It's it's a and that's the thing, right? That's my mom had every reason to be worried because, like, if you're a military person in in the in the Marines, I mean, I have a joke about this that I'll, I'll say, but you guys should probably see me. But in the end, it's like the 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 the. the 
the thing that's the, the thing that's a, a conflict from being an Arab American Muslim and a United States Marine, it's like, dude, you're probably gonna end up going to a country that you're from. And then you're probably gonna have to fight those fucking people, you know. So like this, there's, there's kind of that conflict. And then not only that, the idea of my son joined the Marines and now he might die in a war someday. So I think that's like what really like made my mom go, "Fuck you" to my dad because she was like, for years I've been telling you lay off this motherfucker, and now he's done the worst thing I possibly could think he could do. Do you think that experience though like got you to where you're at today? Like it was necessary. It was very necessary. It was very yeah, necessary. Like if, if you weren't a Marine, would you still be a comedian and like living the life that you're living? I don't know, dude. If I wasn't a Marine, I might have just been stuck in Detroit working some fucking factory job. Or, you know, I've, I've always had uh, inspiration, uh, aspirations to be something in entertainment. Like when I was much younger, I just wanted to be an actor and like I wanted to direct movies, man. I was like really into entertainment because... You know, being a young kid, I was always creative. I was always drawing pictures. I was learning how to DJ. No matter what it was, I was always delving into something creative as a kid. So I don't know. I don't know if I would be in stand-up or if I would be doing anything creative, but I would think I would still try something creative. But then at the same time, man, it's like, I'm glad I joined the Marines because it, it, the, the, the military expedites your life experience. So like what you would experience in a 10 year lifespan as a normal civilian, you know, or even more, as a, as a kid in your 20s, you get 10 years of experience condensed into four years. You get travel, hardship, adversity, you learn about yourself, you learn about what bacon. your limits are physically. Bacon, oh my God, bro. You learn a <laughs> lot, man, you learn a lot. Yeah, I love bacon. <laughs> yeah, that had to have been a big trip for you just to like have such a different I mean were you in a good part of Detroit or were you kind of in I was a, I was in a pretty good part of Detroit I, I lived in an area called Dearborn Michigan where a lot of uh, Muslims and Arabs uh, uh, moved to uh, it's the largest concentration of Arab Americans outside of the Middle East uh, and we'll mean largest concentration if you go to East Dearborn it's so concentrated with Lebanese and now Palestinians and Iraqis and Yemenis that like a lot of the storefronts are bilingual so mm -hmm. it's like it's like a little Lebanon you know um, and um, uh, uh, what was the question again I'm sorry I, I got sidetracked what was the what just I that's such a change of pace dude like from being going from that to from, the Marines yeah and then I'm glad also, I did, like, though. Detroit as itself. At oh, that time where, where I grew up in Detroit. So, so where I was growing up in Detroit, even though I grew up in Dearborn, Michigan, which was a pretty safe thing, I lived two blocks from the border of Detroit. And uh, Michigan and Detroit is so segregated that back then you would walk to the border of where Detroit is, the street, Tireman Street, and you would look behind me and all the homes are, the, are, are nice and manicured and fucking done really nice and everyone behind me is Arab and then you go across the street and it looks like fucking Baghdad and everybody there is black and some of the houses are burnt down and there's it's crime ridden and so like Detroit was a very very segregated place so much so that even though I lived two blocks from the edge of Detroit you felt Detroit because it was right there man and you just cross that one street and it's like and it's like you could just see how the government's like yeah Fuck black people. It's basically what it is. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So, Landau said the same thing. It was like there were these great, like this beautiful neighborhood and then one street over the yeah. projects. The, 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 the most, the, the, the one that probably is the most drastic is on uh, the uh, Detroit's uh, east side. Uh, and, and, and there's a street called Mack Avenue. And if you go one side of Mack Avenue, it's Gross Point Park or Gross Park. Gross point, right? And that's very, very fucking rich. I'm talking about way more money than where I'm from in Dearborn. I mean, the street looks like Leave It to Beaver. It's like a time yeah. port. I think that's and what he was talking to he me. He was about. probably talking about Mac Avenue. Yeah, and then and then and then on Mac Avenue, it's like right behind you, fucking leave it to beaver. And then across the street from you is fucking just straight up. It's Fallujah. It's it doesn't even look like America. It's so crazy. It's bad. Like almost every home you're looking at is burnt down. It's crazy, bro. Yeah. So you were growing up in that environment and then movies was a big piece of what you wanted to do. Like you get out of the Marines. How did that start? 
like you did Second City and then you got into sketch videos. Like what were you doing? What so what was what the I, timeline of this too? Because the internet at that time was different than what it is now. Yeah, the internet barely was anything at the time. Um, I just went, so when I got out of the Marine Corps, I got a really good job working at Detroit Diesel. I was a mechanic on these armored vehicles that were also amphibious, so I was a mechanic on these really cool like tanks that could swim uh, and go on land. And the engines that powered that were Detroit Diesel engines. So to me, it was just like a perfect connection because the, the factory, Detroit Diesel, was like literally 10, 15 minutes from my mom's house. So I got a job there as an engineering technician. Very, very cush job working in like working with prototype engines. So I was a mechanic assembling prototype engines and testing them on stands with the engineers. Very, very cush mechanic job. Uh, but the whole time I was doing that job making so much money, buddy, I, I was fucking miserable, bro. Oh, I was yeah. fucking getting fat. I was working like, uh, it was, I was working at times where like, you know, this, uh, in the winter time I'd wake up, the sun is down and then I'd work. And then by the time I get out of fucking work at six o'clock, the sun is down. So I would never see the sun. And then sometimes I took other people's shifts to make money. I would sleep at the factory. I was all thinking about money, but I was too young to think about my health. And then I kind of fell into a, like a depression. I remember towards the end of that job before I got laid off, I was, I was, I was, I was cranking these, these bolts with a torque wrench on top of the head of this engine. And every time that thing clicked, I go, I could be acting right now. Click, click, I could be acting right now. And that's all I could think of. But then I got laid off from that job. And when I got laid off from that job, I was just like, fuck it, I'm just gonna take a class. And then I went to Henry Ford Community College, met Adam Peacock, told me to go to Second City, this is roughly around maybe 2000, mid-2000, uh, or maybe 2001, I'm not sure. It's really hard to tell. But anyways, within the time of me being at Second City, that's when 9-11 happened. And when 9-11 happened, and then I realized how comedy can teach people, that's when I got really hooked to comedy because 9-11 was heartbreaking for me because before 9-11, I was just some fucking guy. You know, I was just... Uh, uh, an American and a Marine who served this country honorably. And then the right after 9-11, man, the news went from showing you faces of black people to faces that look like me. And then next thing you know, I went from an Arab American United States Marine to having to prove to everyone I'm American. So that was like really heartbreaking and that like fucking hurt me psycho psychologically. So then I found that comedy was an actual, actually an outlet. So whatever grievances that I had, I found ways to get them into scenes and make them fucking funny. And yeah. I found that cathartic because to me, the idea of these white people coming to this show who are being brainwashed to hate people like me, but then they watch me do a scene about something that I'm going through and then making it fucking funny, that to me found like I felt like I was building psychological bridges with people who were programmed to hate me. So that's that's Dude, that's what comedy I mean, that's, is for me. That's like quadruple la layering to like, I mean, you serve the country, you you didn't really have to de deal with any of this shit before, yeah. and you're working this job that you get laid off from that isn't giving you joy at all. But like you you had that loss in your life to like go into that situation and then be faced with like discrimination. It's that's it's heartbreaking. That's a lot dude. for like. It was psychologically heartbreaking for me because I was just proud to be an American. My dad, even though he was were Arab. Fat. Like you uh, were fat. <laughs> I was fat before I joined the Marines. So oh, really? I, oh, yeah, dude. I was I was a diet recruit. I was a half ration. I lost all oh, the man. I went from 215 down to 150 in three months. I, wow. I went in really fat, and then I came out with a six-pack and confidence and talking to women, bro. I was so fat that in boot camp, my nickname, my last name is Ishak. My name in boot camp was Eat Snacks. <laughs> yeah so when i got out of the marine corps i was ripped and jacked but then working that factory job and not paying attention to myself like you should and i think it's just a lesson that i had to learn i blew up like a fucking balloon i was too young to realize that that job was killing me does that make sense oh dude i just i quit a job like that not too long ago where you see people but like you're still ripped 15, so go fuck yourself 20 years yeah well it's 15 20 years into it people like they, they lose themselves, you know? That paycheck is, like, so comfortable. I lost and myself then, in just a span of two years. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah and that they have, like, snacks and the fucking the lunchroom and everything. Like, it's easy if you're unhappy in your life to just, like, you know, fill that void with different things. I but. didn't know I was unhappy. 
I thought I was doing all the right things. I was doing the job, making that money, and fucking bringing in fat paychecks. It's just too True. young to get the bird's eye view of like, dude, go for a run. How come you're not working out anymore? Well, you know, and yeah. so, but I was falling into a depression that I didn't know I was falling into. So then you make these movies though when you go to Second City, and how does that launch you to getting to LA? Because you weren't doing stand up, right? Like you didn't do stand up before you went to LA? No, nah, man. What really did it for me was the mushroom trip that I had in Indonesia. I've said this uh, this story on many podcasts. This was the thing that actually, brother Adam, I'm telling you, bro, this this year is the, the, the defining moment of my life. I was working on this hit show called Swamp People on History Channel. The show was fucking awesome and fun to work on. I got very lucky that everyone on the team was fucking cool and fun. We partied and hanged out with each other. I kind of had like a family, right? And I was also satiating my creative side and my, my filmmaking side because I was tasked to be assembling and producing episodes. It was fucking, it was almost like a dream, right? And you got this from the viral or the online stuff that you had yeah, made? Like that's the, how the, you get this job? Yeah, the show is called Ed, the Ed and Mo Show. It's called Ed and Mo Show. If anybody wants to see it, it's edandmoshow.com. I created it maybe 13, 14 years ago. It's a, it's a, it's a mockumentary uh, react fake reality show that follows two losers from my hometown of Dearborn, Michigan, which has got a lot of Arabs in it. And the main character is a guy named Mohammed. He was a fat Lebanese immigrant who can barely speak English, which is like, if you see him, hear him talk, it's really funny. And then his best friend is a white kid named Ed, who is what we call a way rap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a yeah, white kid yeah, yeah. who's acting and wants to be like an Arab, right? So it's a really, really funny, funny show. We actually predicted Postmates. So before Postmates, uh, the, the storyline is these two guys decide to start a business called We Get It. If you call us, we'll get it. Get it? So, and then everyone in town thinks they're fucking idiots. But, uh, you know, so we predicted Postmates. Uh, and that web series, yeah, got me work on real reality shows. So I was working on this reality show at Swamp People and History Channel. Um, and, just, and I was just for context too, like that was before YouTube, right? Like that was, that was no, just that was a during website? YouTube. Oh no, oh, it, it was, it during was the start of YouTube. Oh yeah, I think YouTube started. Man, YouTube was around like two thousand one, two thousand two, bro. I thought I think it started two thousand six. If I'm remembering right. Okay, maybe two thousand six then. Okay, so then two thousand six because the web series came out in two thousand seven. That makes sense. No, okay. the, so the, you the, were the, like, the, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The first video I made was actually called MTV Cribs Arab American Style. That was the first video that I made. You should look, guys should look it up. MTV Cribs Arab American Style. It's a 13 minute video where I made it look like MTV came to Dearborn, Michigan, and showcased some fat Arab loser guy, and he's showing you his three three bedroom bungalow in Dearborn, Michigan, and the whole time he's trying to convince you it's not his mom's house. So it, it was really, really funny. It's a very, very funny. It, that's the one that put me on the map. When that video blew up around 2007, that's when I got the inspiration to take those two characters and spin off the Ed and Mo show. Does and that make how sense? How did you learn how to do all that production stuff? All by myself, bro. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a what you call an autodidact. I'm like somebody who's a self-starter, self-learner with everything that I do. So, uh, like, when I was in Second City, man, I would spend my nights. I was living in downtown Detroit above a fucking hopping bar that I was also a doorman at. And my friends would fucking be texting me from downstairs at the bar. Be like, bro, we're fucking party. We got bitches. And I would not leave. I was just so addicted to learning how to edit and make videos. I was just, it was, that's where my mindset was. So I delved in it very deep and I taught myself how to edit. I taught myself how to shoot. I was on forums you know, learning from people who are experts and stuff. I was addicted to the internet for information, especially when it was first coming out. Because yeah, when they and this was such a different point in time with the internet too. Yeah, like, there, there was, was no distractions. Websites and like, the, but, but there was no distractions. Like you had to, yeah, you didn't have like these, you didn't have Reddit at that point. Like you, you didn't, didn't have, have TikTok. You didn't have no. Instagram. You didn't have things that were on your phone that would suck your fucking goddamn attention away with, with, with monotonous entertainment. I mean, when the internet first started popping off, it was basically, bro, the library is here. It wasn't like entertainment was here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So like, 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 like the internet for people like me who grew up without it, when that thing was popping off, I was just addicted to the fact that I could get any information I want. I can go on a forum and talk to a real camera guy in Hollywood and you 
know what I'm talking about? It was yeah. like, there was this, 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 I, like what I'm talking to a guy who's actually editing TV shows and he's telling me what program to use and how I can fucking do this. It was just, it was a different type of internet, right? Dude, now, I was doing the exact opposite. <laughs> we were just doing drugs at my house and try, like there was this uh, chat. But you're younger than thing. me. Yeah, yeah. We, we were just getting chat fucked roulette? up. And like, uh, no, not chat roulette. There was this uh, IP relay was what it was. It was like this this tool for people that were deaf to be able to make phone calls. And you okay. would you would call some random person and you'd type in what the operator had to say on your behalf. And you, dude, there was crazy stuff on the internet. Like there when was, it, when it, it was incredible. So you could, you could tell this person to say like, I would call you just as, as your buddy. And you'd answer the phone and be like, Hey, I, you have a call IP relay from Adam Tiller and you'd answer it. And I could tell that person to say whatever the fuck I wanted. Did to you have you. to pay for it? It was free because it was that's like what a, I'm saying. A, Everything was free back then. Yeah, dude. It was wasn't it so, crazy. You could say ridiculous things to like. So some old lady is no like, "Fuck you, suck my dick." To me, a hundred percent. Like <laughs> any anything you want to say. Like people think Chat GPT is like ridiculous <laughs> or whatever. I could tell her to say it was some old lady uh, saying the most disgusting, <laughs> horrible things possible. I didn't even know about this shit, bro. It was tight, dude. It was uh, a lot of funny. Well, because because uh, think about it, the, the the time that we got on the internet, you were a kid. I was trying to start a life. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, to me, I was done with playing. I was all about like trying to make something with my life. Um, this is how I became a man, dude. It's just like, <laughs> sitting behind a Dell in my parents' fucking computer room. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So to 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 cut to the chase, I was at a Swamp People, working that job for roughly four years. Then one day on a vacation, I went to Indonesia, where my family's from. Even though I'm from Yemen, Yemenis have a long history of being in Indonesia, even predating Islam. There's a long history of, of in, uh, Yemenis living in Indonesia and keeping their culture. And some historians think that's why uh, Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world, because they believe that when Islam started spreading in the Middle East, the Yemenis were already acting as a conduit throughout Southeast Asia because they were living there. Does that make sense? So uh, I, I went to some of what you just said. I, okay. <laughs> like I you're good though. Keep, keep going. So, Yemenis have been there forever. So uh, my family lives in Indonesia and I've been going to Bali ever since I was a kid. So in 2015, I believe 14 or 15, uh, I went to Indonesia for one whole month. Uh, and then two of my buddies from Dearborn, Michigan, who created the web series with me, Mike McGettigan and Sean McGettigan, came out to Bali for two weeks with me, and then I showed them around. And then one night, it was Friday the 13th, full moon, and on Bali, they were having this beach party with fire dancers and DJs and drugs and everything. And we and that island is very close to the island of Lombok, where mushrooms, magic mushrooms, grow everywhere, wildly. So I ate 10 grams of mushrooms on an empty <laughs> stomach. <laughs> I really wanted to trip out. Now, mind you, I've tripped out a lot before, but this time, this was the time when I was ready to really take the heroic dose. So Terrence McKenna says the heroic dose is five grams. I took double that. And I fasted yeah. the whole day, so it really hit me. <laughs> what There's time did you take them? Uh, we took them roughly around, I would say, maybe seven o'clock. Uh, we ate them uh on an empty stomach so it would hit us really quick. And then the idea was is that after we ate it, roughly 20 minutes, we'll order something light like a salad so that we could at least have some nutrients in us for the rest of the night, right? Because I'm fasting mm -hmm. the whole day. Bro, when my fucking salad came out, that's when the mushroom kicked in, man. And every morsel of food in the thing, the crouton, the salad, the fucking chicken, all had cartoon faces. When the bowl came up to me, literally, I've never tripped this hard before, cartoon faces. And when I looked down on the bowl, every cartoon face looked up at me and said, don't eat us. <laughs> and I slammed the fuck out of that salad, bro. And we went to the beach to party and I hit the highest peak of my trip. Because if you ever do mushrooms, it's like a roller coaster. It's like the first peak is kind of okay. Then the next peak is higher. And then the next peak is higher. Then you reach your fucking middle highest peak. And I knew it was coming because the entire world started disintegrating and vibrating. Like it was like pixelating and falling apart. Like literally the whole world's falling apart. 
So I told my buddy, Sean, dude, I can't talk to you. So I laid down on the ground and I looked up at the sky and the stars played connect the dots and connected this woman's face. So the yeah. whole sky had this woman's face and I flew up to her. I was so lucid that as I was flying up to her, in the middle of me flying up, I asked myself, am I flying? And then I looked down and I saw an aerial view of myself on the beach. It was so detailed. I have never tripped this hard in my entire life. And I swear to God, in the trip, I made myself laugh because once I realized I was flying, I said, fuck yeah. And then I did the Superman thing and I started like put my fucking fist out and I started flying out to the, to the woman and she was fucking beautiful. And she didn't open her mouth, but she downloaded all this information to me. She basically said to me, go back to comedy. The only real reason you like producing this show is your ego loves the fact that when you go back to Detroit, your friends introduce you to hot girls at the club as this is my Hollywood producer friend. He produces shows in Hollywood. So like she was giving me this clear vision. It's like, yeah, you enjoy it, but you're really good at making people laugh like you did before. And she basically said your ego just likes the boost that you get to walk around saying you're a Hollywood producer. She said, go back to comedy. At the time, I had four rental properties, and she gave me an entire blueprint of how to reinvest my fucking portfolio so that I wouldn't have to work for people. So basically, she was like, go back to comedy, reinvest your real estate, get financially free, and just pursue comedy. She didn't say stand-up. She said comedy. Brother, right after that fucking trip, I fucking sent an email to my producer. I'm like, I'm not coming back next season. As soon as I got back to uh, L.A., I airbnb in my apartment for one whole fucking year. And I flew back to Detroit. I stayed with my mom for about a year and three months. And I went from four homes to nine homes in one year. And were you doing stand-up at the time, too? No, or like... no, no. I was doing nothing. I was just doing real estate for that year. Because yeah. before that, I was doing reality TV. Right after that trip, went to Detroit, invested my entire real estate portfolio. Just focused completely on real estate for a year and three months. Went from four homes to nine homes, rented them all out. Now I'm financially free. I go back to LA and now I got no work. I, I, I never, I'm, I, usually I wake up and I'm fucking having to work for someone. And for the first time, this is so weird. I could wake up whenever I want. And it was, it took about a couple of months to finally get the, the, the wheels turning. And then I was like, you know what, dude, let me go to an open mic. Cause I tried getting my improviser friends first. First I tried to do improv. But in LA, it was really hard to get a group of people to commit at the level that I wanted to commit at. Mm -hmm. So I realized I can't, I can't rely on other people. Let me do something other than improv to keep my comedy chops sharp. I'm like, let me just go to an open mic. And I literally went to an open mic just to stay writing. That was it. I went to my first fucking open mic, bro, in LA. It was inside of a fucking coffee shop. Talk about serendipity, man. What the fuck? I didn't even think I was gonna do stand up. I was thinking I'm gonna go back to improv. I go to an open mic. I do a joke about getting my phone back from a crack dealer in Detroit when I was living in this rough place in Detroit at the time. While I'm telling the joke, Dave Carter, who's another comedian, in the audience, he gets a phone call from his buddy, his cousin in Detroit. And then he goes, Dave goes, dude, it's so funny you called me. Some Arab kid's up here talking about his time in Detroit. And the guy on the phone goes, what's his name? Dave looks at the list. He goes, Mike Eshack. The guy on the phone goes, I know Mike Eshack. Get him on the fucking phone. So as soon as I get off, Dave Carter goes, hey, man, uh, 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 somebody wants to meet you. He gives me the phone, and I find out the guy that's on the phone was the guy that lived in the neighborhood of the story that I was just telling everyone in the fucking Chinese restaurant. How fucking crazy is that, right? Yeah. So me and him connect. I haven't talked to this guy in like 15 years. And the next thing you know, Dave Carter, we connect. And then there's another comic there named Ian Salmon. And Ian Salmon was like, dude, you're fucking funny. He goes, I have a booked open mic. Do you want to do it next week? And that was the beginning of me doing stand-up, bro. It was literally, I, I tripped out. I met God. She said, reinvest your real estate portfolio. Go back to comedy. She didn't tell me what. I go to my first open mic. I tell a story about Detroit. Some guy on the phone is from Detroit. Turns out he used to live in my neighborhood, and he knows me. It connects me to these two comedians, and I do my first show. And did you, when did uh, the social media stuff take off? Because you you've got a huge presence online. Now like, it's starting to get there, but you know there's still more work to do. Uh, I think right now I got 115,000 on Instagram, 130 on Facebook. I got to push TikTok more. I'm about 20,000 on that. I think that started picking up about September of last year when I met. Um, oh fuck! What's his name? Guerrero. Guerrero. What's his first name? Nick. Nick, Nick Guerra. Guerra. Nick Guerra. Yeah, Nick Guerra. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I was opening for him at LA Comedy Club, and he had about 113,000 followers at the time. And me, he's a great guy, and we connected. 
And I was like, how I've did you do it? Him before. And I was like, how did you do it, man? He's a good comic. I was like, I was like, I was like, uh, how did you do it? And he's like, dude, I just started posting clips every day. I just committed to posting clips every day. I go, you don't miss any days? Because sometimes I miss days, but I try to stay on top of it. Uh, and I was there for a week at the LA Comedy Club. And you know me, man. I film and I mic the audience every fucking show. Every show mm -hmm. I've done for three fucking years up to that point, I've been recording every fucking show as professionally as I can. And uh, I started recording that entire week. And that week started having some bangers. We had some good crowds. So every morning I'd wake up, I'd take a clip from that show, I'd put it up. And I'd put it up. And I put it up. And I also followed uh, a, 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 a tactic that uh, David Nihil told me. He said that on Instagram, when you post the reel, you can you can turn off a switch so it doesn't post it to your feed. He goes, if you don't post it to your feed and only post it to your reels, the algorithm will start later, after a while, will start showing it to other people other than your followers. Because at the time I was like, every time I post a video, it's not, it's only showing it to my followers. Even when I look at the insights, I'm like, this is what the hell's going on? And he's like, if you take it off the feed, so I started doing that. And I kept posting, posting, and the videos were only getting 500 views, 500 views, 500 views. And Dave Nihil was right. Within like two to three weeks, next thing you know, something caught fire. And my one video about uh, called Kids Are Terrible, which I thought was supposed to be the biggest video, somehow somebody found it. And then it got like four million views in like no time. And at that time, I was getting 10,000 followers a day. And that thing started blowing up. Then my TikTok started blowing up. Then I started posting on Facebook. Then that started blowing up. So that's just basically it. I was just started, I just I just got on a stint where I started posting clips very often, and that kind of got my uh, my fan base. And then I was also very smart because every video you watch, it's got my website in the middle always. Mm -hmm. It shimmers. It shimmers every ten seconds. If you don't really know, it's psychologically supposed to make you look at it. And then I also put the follow me button on every video. So and I think that kind of helped also. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it. It's, I mean, you're one of the few people I know that's able to tour across the country, and you're making strides. Like, it seems to be consistently like growth is happening, and it's, it's happening, far, but it's also awesome, it's man. not happening. It's kind of like it's some markets I do good, and then some markets I'm like, what the fuck happened? Like out here in Toronto, barely anybody showed up for the shows. So I, I'm, I'm like confused as to what's going on. Um, you know, it's like some markets are good for me, and then other markets aren't. So. On your end, because Instagram only shows the good shit, on your side, it's like, dude, this guy's fucking, you know? But then at the same time, man, I have some nights where I'm like, yeah, it looks like it's going to be good. Like last week in Detroit, man, I was, I was competing with Taylor Swift and the Detroit Tigers all in the same area. Parking was going for $80 to $100 in some of these fucking lots. And people still fucking showed up for my special because I shot it Hell last week. Uh, and, and, and then you do that show last week where you're like, fuck yeah, I'm the man. Then you come here to Toronto and in the two shows, I think I sold 13 tickets. <laughs> Dude, it's, it's a fickle game. It is, bro. So on your end, it looks great, and it is a lot better than it was before. But you know, it it still comes with its ups and downs, bro. I'm For not sure. I'm not at that level yet. Well, I, I want to be respectful of your time. I did ask you to bring on a story, so if, if we can do a quick story, and then we'll get you out of here because I know you got to work tonight. But uh, let me cue up the story time music. I think you should be able to hear it on your end. It's story time, it's story time with Bad Home, yeah, it's story time, it's story time with Bad Home and Friends. Uh, all right, well, this is a story about one time when I was in the Marines and... We were about to get deployed to go to Kosovo. Uh, when you're a Marine on a ship, it's kind of like Club Med. You don't have to do shit. Like the Navy people on, when we're on ship, we all we do is eat chicken breast, work out, and play PlayStation. It's fucking great, right? And when you're on a ship, there's a thing called the Last Supper. I don't know if you ever heard about this before. Marines mm. will know that they're going to be deployed to war. So when you're on a ship in the Marines, um, you're actively on standby. So there's always Navy ships around the Atlantic, around the Mediterranean, constantly touring in six month rotations. And there's always Marines on there. If anything breaks down, we're there to go in, right? And a last supper on a ship is when you, uh, 
when you you as a Marine, you go to the cafeteria, and then every day you go to the chow hall, it's the same old cafeteria food, it's the same rotation, right? And you know you're going to war when you go to the line at the cafeteria, and then the guy in front of you goes, hey, bro, we got lobster. <laughs> we got prime rib. They got all kinds of fucking shit that we didn't have before. It's just fucking great food. Sk- yeah. Shrimp, shrimp, scampi, you fucking name it, right? As soon as, as soon as you hear that, you're like, fuck, we're going somewhere. So we had our, our, our last supper, and then that night, they're like, hey, uh, we got the call from Clinton that we're going to be going into Kosovo because it's getting really bad over there. And uh, we were going to go in through Macedonia. And the captain that we had on the ship was a fucking asshole, bro. This guy, he, he would always get on the horn whenever we would go to like a port city, and then he would just go... All right, so everybody uh, stay away from the red light districts. 90% of the population has AIDS. Uh, 100% of the population has syphilis. Uh, but you know what I mean? Basically just scaring us so that we won't fuck up as hard as we probably are going to, you know? So he'd always play dumb games like that and shit. And then uh, even before that, I remember we were coming back from Rhodes, Greece. And when I and, and, and on Rhodes, because it's an island, we would have to take a, 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 a little... Uh, a, a ferry from the battleship to the shore and on the way back from Rhodes we noticed that all these marines had these like 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 a, a calendar with this hot girl on it and all these marines were like bro I fucked this girl yeah they said don't go to the light the red light district bro me and my fucking crew you only got to pay her this much money you get the fucker <laughs> she's so fucking hot she gives the best fucking blowjobs and then she gives you this calendar so there's all these fucking marines on the thing and, I, and I'm, I'm feeling like I fucking missed out right so we get on the fucking ship and as soon as we get on the ship bro we're in the birthing areas and everything and then you hear Bleep. gentlemen I've told everybody here not to go to the red light districts it looks like some of you guys have because I'm seeing these calendars everywhere so it looks like uh, a few of you went to go see Mrs. whatever her fucking name is. Well, I just got confirmation from um, the Port Authority that uh, she's transsexual. You were fucking a man. And then he hung up. <laughs> Bro, I've never heard the ship groan. You heard Marines and other parts of the ship going, No! What the fuck? I... The trash can was nothing but calendars. It was fucking hilarious, bro. <laughs> I like lost my mind. And then, and then before we went into Kosovo, before we go into Kosovo, this guy gets on the horn, okay? And I don't know if this guy's a troll or not, bro, because everything he does, it's kind of like he's a big fucking asshole. Then this guy gets on the horn. I never seen this guy's face. Then the guy gets on the horn and he's like, gentlemen, we're gonna be shipped out. You guys are shipping out to Macedonia tomorrow to go to Kosovo. And I have some friends in Hollywood. And we are going to have a special presentation of a movie that's currently playing in theaters that you guys are going to be able to watch. We're going to put a big-ass screen on the flight deck, treat you guys to a good movie before you guys ship out, right? Now, mind you, this is the first time I have live rounds. Some of us have live grenades. We've never had a live grenade before, bro. Shit's getting real. They're not even telling us what we're going to do. So we all sit on the flight back, uh, the flight deck, ammo, grenades, the fucking tanks are loaded up and all that shit. We're about to get on these boats and ship out and storm the beach, right? The next morning. The fucking movie goes up and that motherfucker shows us Saving Private Ryan. Saving Private Ryan. Do you know the first hour of that movie is them storming a beach and everybody dying? Yeah. What the fuck is wrong with this motherfucker? Bro, Marines are usually gung-ho. I've never seen a bunch of Marines go around and turn their heads and going, why, why are they doing that to us? <laughs> this is just sad. <laughs> it was insane, bro. Let me tell you something. There was a, there's, there's a scene in that movie where, where, where some guy is on the radio and he's hiding behind a berm and he's calling out orders and everything and then he gets shot in the head but it hits his helmet, right? And it ricochets yeah, off his head. And then he takes it off and then he takes it off to look at it and then he gets shot in the fucking head. Bro, that was, I remember when I saw that, I'm like, what the fuck is this guy doing? What a piece of shit this motherfucker is. There's a guy in my platoon, his nickname was Squirrel. This guy had re-enlistment papers. After that movie was over, we went back to the birthing area. He pulled out the re-enlistment paper in front of me, and he fucking ripped it. It was traumatizing, bro. This guy was a fucking piece of shit, man. He was a fucking piece of shit. I mean, I had a lot of fun times in that, too, man. I remember, like, because I never never called my family. I never called my family. 
because I ran away from them. So to me, it's like, why do I want to call my family? So apparently, I'm like one day, I'm like sitting there, and the fucking captain comes in the birthing area. He's like, Corporal Eshack? And I'm like, yeah, now mind you, I used to always get in trouble. So I'm like, what is it? He's like, follow me. And this guy won't tell me what it is. And I'm like, what, what is it? And we start going up to areas of the ship that I've never fucking been to before, bro. I've never been to any, any top secret rooms. I ended up walking through the bridge. It looked like a Michael Bay movie. It's all dark with glowing maps. And, and then there's fucking captains. I'm in the bridge. What am I doing on the bridge? I'm not supposed to be here. And the guy, the captain who's taking me, he won't tell me why. So we go into this fucking room. And then there's this room that has top secret on it. And it's just all those calendars f that were in the trash just hanging. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, like one guy still had it up because he was like, he was all for it. So I <laughs> the captain opens the fucking door, right? And he goes in the room. He goes, I found him, Corporal Eshek. And this kid gets up from behind a desk. He goes, are you Corporal Eshek? I go, yeah. He looks at the paper. He goes, Corporal Michael Mohammed Eshek. And I was like, yeah. He's like, do you have any idea that the 2nd Marine Division has been looking for you for two fucking weeks and they just found you? I go, what is it? He takes off his fucking comm helmet and he goes, it's your mom. I never called my mom. She found out we were going to Kosovo. So for two fucking weeks straight, she called every Marine Division for two weeks straight until they found me on this fucking ship just so she could bitch me out because I'm not writing her letters. And my mom is such a fucking nice person, man. She likes to send sweets to people if they do good. Yeah. So after I had that conversation with her, it was fucking hilarious. A week after that, next thing you know, I'm seeing Marines on the ship eating sweets you can only get from Dearborn, Michigan. And I'm like, where the fuck are you getting these sweets from? And then they're like, oh, dude, your mom sent them to us for helping us find you. I'm like, this fucking lady, bro. That's awesome. Yeah, so I gave you like three short stories real quick. Yeah, about, buddy. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, before you get out of here, is there anything, like where can people find your stuff? Where can people support you? And then if you have any, up, I mean, we're recording a couple of weeks ahead of time, but if you got any dates you want to plug. Okay, well, um, the best way to find me is I'm Mike from Detroit on everything. My site is MikeFromDetroit.com. If you go there, all my social media links are up there, my YouTubes, my Venmo, my Facebook. Uh, I'm Mike from Detroit on everything, uh, Pornhub, uh, everything. I'm just Mike from Detroit. That's the best way to find me. If this thing is coming out in two weeks, I will be in Tampa, side splitters, July 6th. Uh, and then I will be in Atlanta, July 8th at One Up Comedy. All the links will be up on my site. And uh, the next biggest show after that, because uh, I'll be taking a vacation. I'll be at the Comedy Store La Jolla headlining August 16th for one show. I would love for you guys to come out there. And it's in at September. Uh, hey buddy, look great. You'll get one of these. Yeah, bro. Let, let's uh, hook it up, dude. Those The the door guy there is super fucking nice. I never got a shirt. I've done that fucking place so many times. And I oh, know you better problem. ask at the end of the weekend. I'm going to ask, bro. Uh, and then in September, I'm doing the Looney Bin in uh, for, uh, the Looney Bin Tulsa, 14th to the 16th. And then the weekend after that, I'm doing the Looney Bin in Little Rock, 21st to the 23rd. Uh, and there's going to be more more shows coming up. MikeFromDetroit.com, best, best place to find me. Also, I have a podcast called Public Yemeni Number 1. And you can find that on my website, too. What else? Uh, I love my mom. Dude, thank you so much for coming on. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Make sure to rate and review us. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit that notifications bell so you don't miss our upcoming content. If you have a you. question for Mike or myself, throw it in the comments section or just you. tell us what you think of this episode. Hit that you. like you. button. We're also on Patreon, patreon.com slash FNFpod. And as always, we're on Instagram at FNFpod. We're going to leave you guys with Jaga. I just make the waves, I don't write them. I can hear the lyrics in my spirit as I write them Why you wanna walk and talk just like them? I can't get caught up in all the hype and the excitement I just make the waves, I don't write them I can hear the lyrics in my spirit as I write them Why you wanna walk and talk just like them? I can't get caught up in all the hype and the excitement Welcome to my wave pool, my wave pool Welcome to my wave pool, my wave pool Welcome to my wave pool, my wave pool. Welcome to my wave pool, my wave pool. Welcome to my wave pool, my wave pool.